Thank you uh, for coming tonight to the special presentation by Mary Jo Ignafo on Sarah Winchester, who's a bit of a uh, notorious local history figure. So thank you all for being here. If you have questions throughout the presentation, please go ahead and put them in the Q&A box. Um, I will also be monitoring the chat as we go through, but questions can get lost in there. So if you do have questions for Mary Jo, please put them in the Q&A box. We'll get to them at the end. Uh, and for now, I won't take up too much more of your time. Um, I will let Mary Jo start with her presentation. Thank you. Hello, everybody. And uh, thank you for logging on for a presentation about Sarah Winchester. I appreciate your interest. Um, so 100 years ago this past week, Sarah Winchester died. <clears throat> And uh, the newspaper reported on the day of her funeral was the hottest day of the year. And we all know that in Santa Clara County last week, uh, it was extremely hot. The hottest day of the year in 1922 happened to be 99 degrees. And I think we beat that by about seven degrees. So um, about 12 years ago, I first published the biography of Sarah Winchester. And now it's been um, updated and it's a new version. And so uh, what's changed in 12 years? So the first thing is that after the initial biography came out, I heard from a number of people. Some of them are descendants of Sarah Winchester. So these would be great grand nieces and nephews. These are the... Um, grandchildren, great-grandchildren of her siblings. And so this new book has pictures um, that they provided of Sarah Winchester's siblings, um, which gives it a little bit of a broader uh, feel. The next thing um, group of people I heard from after the book came out, and it was probably over a hundred um, Winchester Mystery House tour guides um, mostly former, some current, dating back as far as the 1940s. And so they gave um, information, new information that I didn't have at the time and kind of broadened out the picture of, of um, the house and things uh, that were unknown when this book first came out. And um, finally, um, just... Um, you know, with technology, there's new possibilities of research. And so a number of new things have emerged. And so um, that's why the update to the book. I always like to start with introducing Sarah Winchester <clears throat> because I'm not gonna presume that everybody knows who she was. So she was a Civil War bride. <clears throat> 19 years after she was married, her husband died. And he happened to die the same year, within a year of his father and Sarah's mother. And then not long after that, um, Sarah's sister died, eldest sister died. And it was after that in the middle 1980s that she relocated from her native Connecticut to California and she was the, an heiress to a good portion of the Winchester Repeating Arms Company. Um, at that time, the most successful arms company in America. And so she lands here in the Santa Clara Valley and buys a small house and, and, and rebuilds it. So um, if you're familiar at all with the house, uh, you may have heard some odd stories. Um, there are staircases that lead to nowhere. Um, she was haunted by ghosts of people killed by Winchester rifles. Um, there are doors that open to nothing. Um, and, and so with the strangeness of the house, there's a lot of innuendo about ghosts and specifically the ghosts of people killed by the Winchester rifle. Well, spoiler alert, almost none of those are true. Um, in fact, there's only a shred of truth in any little bit of that. And it's not just my opinion, it's the historical documentation um, that proves, number one, 
the 196 earthquake is primarily responsible for uh, the strange things at the house. Um, Sarah Winchester's um, fairly traditional uh, religious affiliations and um, her um, complete absence from the spiritualist community in San Jose. So um, I, I would like to just tell you a little bit about something I didn't know when the first book came out 12 years ago. So I knew that um, after Sarah Winchester died, the people that occupied her house had been in the amusement park business. In fact, an inventor of a roller coaster. And I knew that they envisioned an amusement park on the property. But what I now know, after a little more research, is they actually created that amusement park. And so they had a parking lot paved for 5,000 cars. Uh, to me, it's astonishing there were 5,000 cars in Santa Clara County um, in 1923. They had lights strung in the parking lot. They had a huge round dance pavilion built, um, open air, but covered from the sun. They had jazz bands come and occupy the center with the dancing around. They had concessionaires of cigars and ice cream and sodas. Um, they had mechanical rides. They had the whole thing. They, they, they laid out a swimming pool and they laid out where the roller coaster would go. And of course, as the side light, there was um, a haunted house. And they had a grand opening for Winchester Amusement Park in June of 1923, about 10 months after Sarah Winchester's death. And hundreds and hundreds of people came. The local railroad, the Peninsula Railroad, actually changed its schedule to accommodate the crowds of people coming to Winchester Amusement Park. It was a nickel for children, 10 cents for adults, and the, it was a wildly successful weekend. They had a number of um, magic acts, uh, a few different bands, um, wildly successful. And then after that, no one really came back. And so Santa Clara Valley at the time was very rural and farmers and farm families might patronize an amusement park like the county fair once a year, but they were not gonna be coming back on a weekly basis. They couldn't afford it and they actually didn't have the time. And some some people commented, yeah, well, if I need a roller coaster, I can just go to the, the boardwalk in Santa Cruz. And so Winchester Amusement Park failed. And by November of that year, um, we find in court records, liens filed against the property and the property owner. So these amusement park people actually were leasing the property. Somebody else still owned it. Um, um, liens filed against the property and then several lawsuits. So the electrical guy, the concrete people, um, all the trades people, several of the concessionaires sued. And so it's a big uh, kind of financial debacle these people find themselves in. Um, but, but what comes as a surprise is that people keep tourists or, or locals keep stopping by and are willing to pay to go through the house. And so what um, was presumed to be just a side light of this amusement park turns out to be the main draw and the sustaining um, factor in, in the rest of their careers um, at the house. So those people, John and Mamie Brown, um, had the house through the 1940s. When they died, it was taken over by their two daughters. And now um, the grandchildren and great-grandchildren of, of them um, are, the, are in the owner's group of Winchester Mystery House. So um, I thought what I would do now is share some pictures. Um, so the new edition of the book has 
um, I think 28 new images in it. I'm not going to show them all, but I'll show some things that I discovered. So let's hope that um, my share is working here. Okay, so this is a portrait of Sarah Winchester. Um, it's taken um, in the 1870s, and we can pinpoint um, it's one or two of two years in the 1870s. It was taken in um, San Francisco. So why is um, Sarah Winchester in San Francisco in the 1870s? Because the Winchester Repeating Arms Company had just opened an office on Market Street. And she and her husband were out kind of as emissaries for the Winchester Arms Company. So at by this time, the Winchester Company is owned and operated by Sarah's father-in-law, and her husband is is um, a vice president and working on behalf of the company. Um, this um, image um, is the earliest known image of the Winchester House. And it was just uncovered um, about seven or eight years ago. And in an archives, didn't really know what they were looking at, but a couple people began to identify it. And if you look, I, get, I think my mouse will do this. Yeah, so down here we have a woman seated, looks very much like Sarah Winchester, of course, too small to be, um, uh, you know, to to prove or disprove but it, it looks like other pictures of her like that portrait I just showed you kind of the same kind of haircut and here um, it looks very much like her niece um, Daisy uh, Sarah Winchester's niece lived on this property with her for 12 years um, and so then the house gets um, added on to to a great degree and this is a postcard image from just before 1906. So the tower here um, goes to seven stories. And so we have lower levels here. These pillars and this gate still exist on Winchester Boulevard, but they're covered by an oleander hedge. So you cannot see them from the street. Um, they say Winchester and Yanata Villa, which is what she called her home. Those the lettering is is gone. It's not there anymore. I don't know what if if it was removed or fell away or whatever. <clears throat> so from this, um, you can see there's been quite a few additions. Okay. <clears throat> so this is not the Winchester house. This is the Hayes Mansion, built in the same decade. And this was built by Mary Hayes Chenoweth for herself and her two sons and their families. So through, it was built like three family residences and connected in the middle. And so when you look at it, it's, you don't automatically think it's that radically different than Sarah Winchester's house. But there were so many stories in the paper about how strange Sarah Winchester was. <clears throat> and no stories in the paper about Mary Hayes Chenoweth. And let me tell you, Mary Hayes Chenoweth, uh, she really lived her own way. So, um, she married a man 20 years her junior. She was an avowed spiritualist and faith healer. On this property, she built her own church and was the propri proprietor, what do you, would you call it, a pastor, minister of the True Life Church. <clears throat> Excuse me. And no one um, in the newspaper ever uttered a bad word about her. Well, the reason is because Mary Hayes Chenoweth's sons owned the San Jose Mercury News. And so um, where there were terrible stories about Sarah Winchester building this odd, uh, big Victorian house, possibly for multiple families, there was never a word against uh, Mary Hayes Chenoweth. <clears throat> These are some visitors that came um, that we now know um, 
since the original publication of my book. Um, these are also relatives of Sarah Winchester. Excuse me just for a minute. <clears throat> On um, over here, we have her two nieces. So th these are the daughters of her brother. And this young lady is uh, her brother's granddaughter, the daughter of, of this woman. And um, they visited in 1915 and they stayed for the better part of a year. And they stayed at Sarah Winchester's ranch in San Jose, even though um, Winchester herself, after the earthquake, moved to Atherton. So um, they would be driven up to the Atherton house for visits and Mrs. Winchester would be driven down to the ranch um, uh, for visits. Um, th this um, woman, uh, Hazel Beecher, ended up writing about what her memories were and she wrote them in the 1970s. And um, so I've included those in the new edition of the book. Um, these are Sarah Winchester's two sisters. Um, this uh, woman uh, um, came to California the same year as Sarah Winchester, um, not because Sarah came, but because her husband, this woman's husband, was made um, get, uh, hired as president of Mills College in Oakland. Um, that didn't turn out to be a good story. Uh, he got fired within a year and it was really uh, ugly in the press, um, not a good thing. Um, this sister also came out the same year because she had just gotten a divorce. Um, and, so, and Sarah got her a house in San Francisco where she lived with her two um, almost adult children. By the way, this is Estelle, uh, Gerard, Estelle Pardee Gerard, she um, was the youngest of the six uh, Pardees and um, first to die. And she actually died at Sarah Winchester's San Jose Ranch in the 1890s. Um, so this is Jenny Bennett. This is Sarah Winchester's sister-in-law. So um, she's um, Sarah's husband's sister. Jenny's husband was the president of Winchester Repeating Arms. So Jenny and Sarah are about equally wealthy. They both, um, so Jenny and her brother uh, inherited uh, each half of the Winchester company. Um, and then when her brother died, Sarah inherited the rest. Uh, I'm not entirely sure they had such a great relationship just because in the letters, Jenny is asking when she can come to California and um, what season is the best time to travel. And Sarah writes back and says, oh, I'm just not settled enough to invite guests. And she had been in California for 10 years. So I'm not sure she was ever gonna get settled. But anyway, um, finally, Jenny comes in 1915 where the other relatives did too. And so, um, I can't, I, I, I'm missing a slide here, but I'll tell you in a minute why 1915 was an important year. So I also heard from descendants of some of Sarah Winchester's employees. You know, my great grandfather worked as a gardener for Sarah Winchester, whatever. And some, some of those names can be proven um, with documentary evidence and some, a, you know, I would never say no, your great grandfather didn't, but I'm just more comfortable um, putting it in a book if, if, if there's some other corroborating source. Anyway, this is Misa Harada and um, Henrietta Severa. Severa was uh, Winchester's personal nurse for 12 years, and Misa Harada was her dresser um, and, and um, yeah, her dresser, personal maid. And um, they traveled with. Winchester from property to property, uh, from San Jose to Burlingame to Atherton. This is Ida Winchester Nishihara. She is the <clears throat> granddaughter of Winchester's gardener. 
Ida was uh, born in San Jose at the San Jose ranch. And so um, there's a lot of stories that Sarah Winchester spied on her employees. Uh, they didn't like working for her. Uh, she was always suspicious of them. And, and I just think if there was a bad relationship between the Nishiharas and Mrs. Winchester, that they, it's not very likely they would have named the, a child. It, you don't name a child for somebody that you don't really like, I wouldn't think. Anyway, since the original book came out, I also did some more research on the Nishiharas. And it, moving forward, whatever became to Ida, uh, became of Ida, the Nishiharas were interned in um, Heart Mountain internment camp during World War II. And she was interrogated um, for being um, a spy, speaking Japanese. And um, uh, anyway, uh, the, the interrogation ends up acknowledging that she did not speak Japanese, that she had never been to Japan, that she was an American citizen, and that she was not a spy. In fact, she had gone to San Jose State and gotten a, a degree. So um, anyway, it's unfortunate uh, what became of uh, uh, Sarah Winchester had an unusually high number of uh, Japanese employees. <clears throat> Oh, this is the picture I was going to show earlier. So uh, in 1915 was the World's Fair, the Panama Pacific Exposition in San Francisco. And um, that's why a number of visitors from the East came out. So 18 million people went to the World's Fair that year. So uh, a lot of people were traveling to California and um, including Sarah Winchester's um, relatives. So this image is in the photo album, the family photo album of the ranch foreman, John Hansen. And John Hansen also did us the favor of keeping uh, day books every year from 1907 to 1922. And so on August 5th, 1915, he writes in the day book, I took the household to the fair, all of us. And um, this picture is in the photo album of his family photo album for that week. Um, the archives that stores this image is not comfortable to identify this right here as Sarah Winchester. Um, but if you look at it, it with other images, um, one in particular where she's in a horse-drawn carriage, it looks like the same person. And this could very well be Jenny Bennett. So I'm not sure why this would be in the family album if it wasn't them. Um, but in the book, I have it identified as possibly them. I think it's them. So this is the plot, um, Sarah Winchester's and her husband's plot in New Haven, Connecticut in a cemetery. The little cross is where their infant daughter died. Their, their daughter died at age um, six weeks. Um, this monument is huge. So like if I was standing next to it, I would be like up to there. Uh, I mean, it's it's 10 or 12 feet. It's really, really big. But the reason I, I included this in the book is because I looked at this five times before I saw what was really interesting to me. Um, it's not inscribed for Sarah Winchester. So clearly this is before she died. Um, it's dated to 1920. So she had made the arrangements for this monument for her husband and her infant child. Um, and if you go there today, you see all of this, except for with the added inscription of Sarah Winchester. This is an ad for that amusement park um, that uh, showed in the Mercury News. Um, in style and comfort at downtown prices, good eats, dancing. <clears throat> 
this is a picture of the house in, in pretty significant disrepair circa 1940s. <clears throat> this is um, Matt Coronado. So um, one of the most enjoyable things since the book came out is a couple of tour guides from the 1940s contacted me and I was able to interview them. They have since died. But they told me some really interesting things. So they were, as high school boys, were trained to give tours to tourists and they were trained by the original owners. And so I asked things like, so did they think the house was haunted? And he said, oh no. They didn't think it was haunted and they didn't tell us to say it was haunted. Um, what did they say about the stairs that lead to nowhere? Well, they said it was earthquake damage. And so besides the story, what's what stands out for me is all of those tales that started to get spun came after the original owners. So in the next generation, and it was the, the next generation that wrote a script for the tour guides that kind of codified the, the mythology so that everybody was saying the same thing. Anyway, so Matt Coronado here was by all accounts kind of quite the character. And he was actually the gardener and then sometimes janitor. And then in a pinch, he would give um, tours. So uh, uh, Bob Kelty, one of the high school boys said, oh yeah, Matt um, set up a, a place where people could pitch coins. So they come out of the tour and they pitch some coins in and um, the owners never knew. At the end of the day, Matt would split it up with whoever the other tour guides were. So uh, they, they had some times there, I think. This is an aerial view. If you're not from San Jose, it might not mean as much to you, but here's the Winchester house. All of this is what today is Santana Row. Here's Stevens Creek Boulevard. And if you look up here, you see the E on the side of the building, the Emporium Department Store, current uh, day men's Macy's. There's no Highway 280 over here. Um, there's no dome theaters here. So for 60 or 70 years, that is a lot of development that's going on right there. This book, this picture is in the book too. This, um, during the 1970s, early 80s, um, the house manager convinced the owners of the house that it would ben it, they would benefit by having the house named a historic structure. And so this is an official picture that you'd find in the Library of Congress um, that was, you know, trying to um, make it a national on the National Register of Historic Places. And here you can see the Dome movie theater. So the Dome theater, there were four and then five of them on the property over there owned by the owners of the Winchester house. And the Dome theaters were designed by the husband of one of the daughters. So um, it was kind of a, definitely an all in the family thing. So I've added this picture to finish out the little slideshow. Um, and I'll tell you uh, what my experience was. So <clears throat> it's a national, um, it's on the national register and it's a um, state historic landmark, the house. And so many, when many visitors come, they presume that that means um, it's owned by the state, which is not the case, it's privately owned. Um, but in order to get a property listed on the National Register or the status historic uh, listing, um, you have to have a historical analysis of the property and hopefully it's a correct one. Well, this one I discovered in the original papers um, says things like construction began in 1884. Well, that's not true. Sarah Winchester didn't even come until 1886 and continued without interruption until Mrs. Winchester's death in 1922. Also um, not true, 
there were any number of years where no construction happened and Sarah Winchester um, didn't even live there for the last 12 years of her life. She lived in Atherton. And so I, I contacted the National Register and the State Office of Historic Preservation. It's not because I object to the house being listed, it's because it's listed on false data. And so what could I do to correct the data? So here's the historical documentation, National Register and State Office of Historic Preservation. And they said, well, that's all fine and well, but um, it doesn't matter what the data is. Only the owner of the property can change um, what, what's listed. And I said, even if it's false or incorrect, it's historically inaccurate. Yeah, well, that's, yeah, yeah. It has to be the owner. It's like, wow, huh, that's something. Okay. So anyway, um, these are, are still exist, even though the documentation it is a false. It could be corrected, but yeah, there's only one place it could be corrected. So I'd like to share with you um, a little bit of what I heard from um, a tour guide from the 1970s. And I'll just read a paragraph. This, you kind of might be familiar with the house. If, if you've never been to the house, this might be meaningless to you, but the, on the tour, they make quite a big deal out of the ballroom. So Scott Bailey from the 1970s developed a lifelong fascination with the house and its builder. He examined every nook and cranny. And I, my explanation, exploration of the basement, he wrote, I found the central annunciator box where all the wiring was labeled with the room it served. A fellow guide and I traced the various wires with an interesting outcome. According to that system, the ballroom is actually the music room. That would certainly explain the smaller dimensions of what is currently called a ballroom. The actual ballroom, it seems, was on the south side of the house where the collapsed chimney still faces Winchester Boulevard. So um, again, not, none of us would ever have that information without somebody who is like crawling around in the basement of the house. It, it's, it's something that would um, be entirely unknown. And um, I, I'm not saying it for misrepresentation of the ballroom. I'm just saying, it just makes more sense that that was a music room. And I'm glad somebody pointed that out. And then I will just finish with one final paragraph. It's the final paragraph of the in the book. And this sums up kind of the whole purpose of wanting to write about and make the story straight about Sarah Winchester. So this is the last paragraph in the book. The widow Winchester was caught in the crossfire between her own inclinations and the social expectations of rural San Jose. She stood as a different sort of frontiers woman, demanding a right to privacy, defending herself from defamation and libel while fight fighting off provincial neighbors. She was also caught in a much broader cultural crossfire, one that echoes in our day gender bias, debates over gun violence, the stigma of mental health challenges, and wide ranging beliefs about the hereafter. No longer able to defend herself, her house lives on as a mystery house where she remains captive in a labyrinthine narrative with its twists and turns around truth and deception. And so that's my presentation for now. And um, if people have questions, I think Megan is going to uh, facilitate yes. that. I will moderate. Thank you so much, Mary Jo. Um, I got to say, as someone who works with information, I'm a little flabbergasted about the information about the National Historic Register won't change. It's, <laughs> it's disturbing, just, isn't it? It makes me wonder now all the signs I've ever seen. And um what on there is real. <laughs> so thank you for sharing your experience with that. So first, somebody did ask if we could post a link to the online store where you would prefer they buy the book from. I do have the University of Missouri link. Is that the one you prefer or is there one that's better? 
it's kind of the question of the hour. So mm -hmm. I've been told that um, um, barnesandnoble.com has um, a supply, mm -hmm. but if you go to my website and click on uh, maryjoignafo.com mm -hmm. and click on the book jacket, it will lead you to the publisher, University of Missouri. Okay. So I, either of those, um, thank you for anybody who'd like the book. <laughs> so I will add that in here. I'm adding it in the Q and A and I'll also put it in the chat. If that's easier for folks to uh, grab it. New edition of the book. Okay. Um, we also just had a comment. Thank you so much for telling the truth. I'm very grateful for you. So thank you for that. Um, somebody did ask, how much money does the house make per year? Is that something that you know? I do not know. And um, I, I would I would venture to guess no one knows. Maybe, it, maybe an accountant, but it's privately owned. They don't have to disclose anything. They, okay. It's not a corporation, so. Okay. Um, Kathy said they have questions. Kathy, I will unmute you so that you can ask your questions. So if Kathy is there, you should be able to unmute yourself now if you have questions you'd like to ask. Oh, here they are. Okay. Um, what are your thoughts on the strange architecture of the Winchester Mystery House? Is there any truth to Sarah Winchester continuing to build to support out-of-work residents at the time? So, um, yes, there's truth um, that she had a real affinity for tradesmen. And so her, um, the woman I pointed out as her nurse for 12 years um, reported that the house was Sarah Winchester's hobby house. And she would say, oh, I like that. No, tear that down. Let's build this like a canvas. And what uh, part of her motivation was to keep tradesmen uh, working. But I would also like to add that the her house um, compared to other Victorian houses is, is not that strange. They, you know, they tended toward these very ornate small, um, small rooms, but the very strange things about the chimney sealed off and the up, um, stairs that lead to nowhere and doors that open to nothing, that's earthquake damage. Not the 196 earthquake. I mean, it's seven stories in the top four collapsed. So it was significant earthquake damage. We're getting quite a few questions about um, her Atherton house. So somebody asked where she lived in Atherton and if the residence was similar to the Winchester house in San Jose. Um, so um, it's on Inglewood off Atherton Avenue and it's not similar in any way, shape or form. And um, during the, that um, World's Fair Panama Pacific Exposition, there was a publication put out with the finer homes of the San Francisco Bay Area and her house is pictured in it as a, you know, a luxurious but very normal house. Um, somebody also asked if the house in Atherton is able to be toured. Uh, it's privately owned. I can tell you this, in, um, I can't give you the exact date, but in 19 or uh, 2016, the house was renovated and it was written up in Gentry Magazine. So there's an article and pictures, but yeah, it's uh, it's a private owner. I'm, I'm sure they would not like you touring their house. <laughs> um, someone probably, so some, another family lives there. It's a residence, I'm yes. assuming. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, somebody also asked, did Sarah ever live in Los Altos with relatives? Sarah Winchester owned 140 acres um, that is now the city of Los Altos. And, and the house that she owned there is still there on Edgewood Drive. And it's the oldest um, house, residence in the city of Los Altos. Um, I have toured that house. Um, that is also privately occupied. 
So she, um, uh, she, she owned it, but she let her sister Bell and family uh, live in it. Um, and then when Central Pacific or the railroad um, sliced through it, it cut the grazing land from the creek. And so it was no longer able to be used as a ranch. And so that's when she sold it. But that house is still there too. Um, somebody asked how much land the family own, how much land does the family own at this time? And did they sell off the theater and mobile park land? Okay, that's a, it's not, I'm not an expert on that, but it was a, a separate group of families own the mobile home park. It's not, it was not the people that own uh, the Winchester house. That was a different group. Um, and as far as I know, um, where the movie theaters were um, has been developed and or is being developed and is still owned um, by the owners of the house. Um, let's see. Just trying to ask these in an order that makes sense. Um, so somebody, they noted that they missed the very beginning of the presentation. So sorry if you already answered, but thank you for your research. Um, did Sarah Winchester die wealthy and did she have any descendants? So um, her estate when she died was um, between three and $4 million, which um, was quite significant in 1922. Um, she had um, established trust accounts for all of her nieces and nephews and grand nieces and nephews, where they, um, and she had established them long before she died, um, where they would um, get a stipend every month from the trust for their lives. So those went on after she died. However, the, um, those accounts, once that niece or nephew died, they would revert to um, benefit the hospitals she endowed in New Haven, Connecticut. Um, and the last of those descendants died just in 2010. So, and the, and the endowment still exists. It's part of Yale University Medical Center. Okay. Um, a couple of questions about the Winchester House. Um, somebody asked, did anyone actually tell Sarah that if she kept building, it would keep the ghosts away. Uh, there's no historical evidence for that. And then um, somebody also asked, were odd features uh, such as windows in the floor, seance room, et cetera, added after her death to bolster the strangeness of the house? Um, I honestly don't know about the windows in the floor situation. Um, other things were changed. The whole um, idea of um, obsession about the number 13, um, according to um, a tradesmen who worked on the house, said those were additions after she died. Okay. Um, somebody also asked, oh, they said they saw this tidbit online when they were looking up her other residences. Um, is there any truth to Sarah Winchester being called the mercy lady and trying to convince people to go vegetarian? That's her niece. Okay. So um, her niece um, ran, uh, she, it, Sarah Winchester had a houseboat in Burlingame and, and when she couldn't get there anymore, she let her niece and her husband live there. And it was called the like camp of mercy or something. And she was, um, an ardent animal rights person. And um, I'm not sure about the vegetarianism, but yes, and she was a published poet and she wrote about these things. But yeah, that's Sarah Winchester's niece. Okay. Um, also speaking of her nieces and nephews, um, somebody asked if her, Sarah's descendants or extended family um, still own the property. No, and no one in her family has owned it since she died. Okay. It's it's owned by a, a family who moved in when she died. Yeah. Okay. Um, another question about the house. Um, this person says they haven't visited yet. They're wondering if you've seen the models of the house at the San Jose Mineta Airport 
and Legoland Discovery Center at the Great Mall. If you have seen the models, are they a nice preview of the actual house? Uh, I haven't seen the Lego one, but the, I have seen the one at the airport. It's pretty awesome. Yeah, I'm trying to think where is, I've been to that airport quite a few times and I can't think of where that model is. It's, it's, uh, well, it, it's near where you, the gates for Alaska Airlines. I know that. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, if I fly Alaska, I'll have to check it out. I'm intrigued. <laughs> I have been to the house, but it would be neat to see a model. Um, we have a couple questions about your writing and your books. Um, so somebody said they saw an article in the San Jose Mercury about your book uh, and the centennial um, and asking if you can reiterate what's new in the centennial edition, which I think you touched on a little bit at the beginning. Um, so maybe just for folks who came in a little bit late, what's new with the new edition of your book? So um, the new edition has um, the final chapter um, was changed. And a, and a new final chapter added, there's a new preface and there's 28 additional images. And most of the new information either is um, derives from Sarah Winchester's descendants and um, tour guides who have contacted me, written to me, and many of whom I've interviewed um, from the 1940s to the present day. Um, I'm glad you mentioned a tour guide because the next question is from a former tour guide. Mm -hmm. uh, they said they memorized the script. Um, and as you're familiar with the script, their impression after reading your book is that at best, 25% of the script has a basis in fact. What are your thoughts on the tour script and the stories they tell at the house? Well, gee whiz. Um, <laughs> really putting you on the spot. <laughs> You know, I when I just read that final paragraph in my book, and it's, it, it, you know, you can never say it it's all wrong or it's all right, but there's a lot of outright fabrications, and what's most unfortunate is you know the characterizations of Sarah Winchester as crazy or mentally ill or uh, um, whatever. Um, so yeah, the tour script, I, I, I've been um, handed, sent variations of the tour script for the last 10 years, and it gets updated from time to time. I, somebody just the other night told me, um, who was a tour guide, um, there was a whole story about President Roosevelt coming to town and Sarah Winchester snubbed him and everything. And um, it, it, none of it's true. And it's all, you know, and you can prove it by... Uh, Roosevelt's schedule, by what he said, by where he went, uh, by where Sarah Winchester, Sarah Winchester was in San Mateo at the time. Um, and so there's all kinds of ways of, uh, of proving it. And, and the tour guide said, yeah, we were told a couple of years ago, stop telling that story. It's not true mm. anymore. So yeah. Yeah. You know, they're in the business, they're in the tourist business and I'm in the history business. And so, yeah, different. Um, so speaking of your writing, uh, somebody wanted to know what will be your next big adventure in writing? Oh, that's a very nice question. I'll have to get back to you on that. Um, <laughs> I'm always writing something. I will mm -hmm. say that. Okay. To be determined. <laughs> um, also, earlier you had mentioned the endowment at Yale. Um, somebody asked if Sarah Winchester supported any charities in the San Jose area. Um, she did, um, not to the extent that uh, she, she gave a, few, a couple million dollars to endow the hospital, um, in San Jose, smaller sums, like $500 to save the Redwoods campaign when Big Basin was established. Um, she, she, um, helped some environmental groups. She made a contribution to O'Connor Hospital. Um, she made a contribution after this, uh, the earthquake of 1906 for earthquake victims and the Red Cross. Um, and how do I know any of this? Because I saw canceled checks. Mm. It's, it's in the archive. Okay. Um, it looks like we have a couple people who are raising their hands. So I think they want to ask their question aloud. Um, so Nicole, if you would like to unmute yourself, you can ask your question.
If you're there, Nicole, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Okay, we're gonna move on to the next person. Uh, Marilyn, if Marilyn would like to unmute and ask your question. Okay, perhaps- Am I they, doing something wrong or? No, perhaps they raised their hands on accident. Okay. Um, so we're gonna go back to the Q and A box. Um, okay, let's see, we got two more questions. Um, are there any records kept, diaries, et cetera, that either Sarah Winchester or her employees kept? And was it difficult to get firsthand information about her time there? Well, um, the most important records that I found were letters that she exchanged with her attorney over the period of about 20 years. And so like good attorneys do, um, he kept both sides of the conversation. And so those letters reveal a person that's very different than the persona that we've heard about. And those letters are the main reason I wrote I wrote the book because I felt like no one had kind of had, had known about those. And so between those letters and then the day books kept by the um, ranch foreman, which I wouldn't go so far as to say diaries, um, but they do indicate, you know, Mrs. Winchester um, came to the San Jose ranch for two hours today. And, you know, no one ever used to report that she actually lived in Atherton. She did not live in the San Jose house for the last dozen years of her life or whatever. Um, but those day books show when she came, when she left, who was with her, what she brought. Sometimes, uh, you know, she asked for the sewing machine to be sent to Atherton, that kind of thing. So um, somebody asked, where are the archives that you accessed? So um, in, in a couple locations, uh, History San Jose Archives um, has a big bulk, has John the John Hansen uh, records. And by the way, if you go online to History San Jose, the Winchester records have been put online. You can find them. Um, uh, Stanford University Archives, because the lawyer was on the board of, first board of trustees of Stanford, he was also Jane Stanford's attorney. And then um, the archives at San Mateo County History Museum. Um, there's a couple of um, patrons in the 1960s who were kind of um, passionate, obsessive about Sarah Winchester and collected every known document they could find. And that collection is in San Mateo. Um. Oh, this is interesting. Uh, somebody said that they took your class through the OLLI program at Santa Clara University. Okay, okay. Um, they said, I'm reading Who Killed Jane Stanford by Richard White. <laughs> um, I read the comments about Jane Stanford differently than if I had never taken your class. Who is advocating for her? Well, now, isn't that a good question? Um so I would I would ask this person back, do you think Richard White is? Do you think the author is advocating for her? Hmm. I don't know. I, I read that book. I, I, I thought it was quite a good book, um, but she was a difficult person. It turns out this attorney, uh, he had a difficult wife. He, he had, he had um, a knack for uh, working with difficult people, I think. Or, or challenging people. That's another book that's been very popular here. Sarah Winchester books are always very popular at this library and the Jane Stanford book has been popular lately too. So I think a lot of people are reading it. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, somebody asked uh, if you have other talks planned at other local libraries um, and are you open to local invitations? So maybe this person wants to invite you to speak. How would they get in touch with you? So um, probably the best is my website, marijoignafo.com. Um, and are you planning on, on speaking at any other libraries? Um, this is the last one so far for the um, 
this book launch. Mm -hmm. um, oh no, that's not true. I do have one in, in January as well. Um, I, I, I'm um, probably less available for book clubs, but. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, another question about the house. Uh, is the current furniture in the house originally owned by Sarah Winchester? No. I don't know about anybody else, but I, I guess I was, I don't know what I was expecting. The first time I ever went there and it wasn't furnished, I, I, I was like, wow, I, I was just expecting a furnished house, but no, um, they, they've, they've got some beautiful, they've done a lot of work about getting period pieces. And there's some rooms that are being furnished now, but none of it belonged to Sarah Winchester. <clears throat> so more decorative or just trying to fit, but if it's the time period, but it's not her furniture. Right, right, right. Okay. But they don't claim it is hers mm -hmm. either, mm -hmm. so. Okay, um, well, we ran out of questions in the Q&A box, but some of you might be typing them right now. So we'll give you a couple minutes if you have any last questions. Um, we put the, oh, here come more. <laughs> um, was there an architect, an actual architect of the house? No, she uh, she acted as architect. She did use um, Jacob Lenzen designed a big um, barn and horse stable um, in in like 1890. But for the house, she relied on herself and her carpenters. And then after the earthquake, when uh, there were reports that she felt pretty humiliated by her lack of skill in. Mm -hmm. um, probably engineering. <laughs> okay. Um, somebody asked if you are allowed to visit the Winchester house. Yeah, I was invited um, even as recently as three or four weeks ago. Um, All right. So you haven't been banned for your <laughs> truth telling. Well, you know what? When my book first came out 12 years ago, um, a group wanted to hold an event there and um yeah that was denied oh, so there, okay. there's there's been a detente I guess so <laughs> um somebody wanted to ask if you know why Sarah didn't repair the house after the earthquake uh I don't know precisely why except that she was like her um, her niece's husband said she was pretty humiliated but that what the earthquake you know showed how poor her skills were mm -hmm. but I would also remind people how old she was so um, by this time she's approaching 70 years of age 70 years of age in 196 or 7 is not today's 70 um, so um, the life expectancy for a white female in America in 1910 was 49. So she was she was kind of up there. And I think she was just ready to not do the construction projects, not manage the crews. And so she had the chimney sealed off and roofing restructured. So stairs go right into the ceiling and the debris hauled away, <clears throat> excuse me. Okay. But I think part of that was age. And then, and then, you know, you live in a, in an old house that needs a lot of attention and uh, you're offered a brand new one. Sometimes that's kind of tempting. And there were uh, fewer, she wasn't bothered by um, the press and by neighbors as much up in Atherton as she was in San Jose. Um, also regarding the earthquake, somebody asked if Sarah was inside the house during the earthquake. So <clears throat> the house tours claim that she was, and they've identified a room that they say she was in. And <clears throat> I'm not sure how they proved that, but I'll tell you how I went about looking for it. So I, I searched through records to find <clears throat> um, where she was. And I can look at, you know, the ranch foreman's day books. It was inconclusive. I do know the week before the earthquake, 
the lawyer um, had in his telephone log having called Sarah Winchester at her Atherton house. So she was in Atherton at least a week before the earthquake, um, where she was on the earthquake. Uh, uh, um, I feel like no one's really able to be definitive on that. Um, maybe somebody can come up with data that will prove, prove one way or the other. Okay. Um, I know it's seven o'clock now, so just a couple last questions, if that's okay. Um, somebody did ask, did Sarah ever love again after her husband? Yeah, that's beyond my purview. <laughs> All right. And then this, um, I think this is a follow-up to a comment you made toward the beginning. Um, somebody made perhaps your next writing uh, adventure. Would you be interested in doing a biography of the strange Hayes Chenoweth lady? Oh, um, that's been done. Uh, and it's pretty, uh, so there's definitely, is a book called, e I'm going to get it wrong, Edenfell. Uh, first, the author's name is Nancy. I can't get it, but definitely a book on the Hayes Mansion, which goes into a lot about Mary Hayes Chenoweth. And then she wrote her own book on the True Life Church and her healing. So, yeah. There's there's material on her, and she was. Um, did the did the questioner say she was weird or what was the word? Um, I think she said strange. Strange. Okay. Yes. Well, mm -hmm. people use that word for Sarah Winchester too. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, Mary Hayes Chenoweth was com was comfortable with um, how she was. Yeah. yeah. And and no one would ever say the owners of the newspaper's mother was strange. <laughs> Um, somebody else also just is observing that the Archer Kelly family would be fascinating to have you cover. Oh, so all kinds of ideas for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, all right. So I think we're going to wrap it up. I just want to read, I want to make sure you hear these nice comments people are leaving. Um, somebody said, thank you, Mary Jo, for your work. I'm a Santa Clara Valley native and the house has always been a fixture. I'm so glad someone has set the record straight. Um, somebody else said, thank you. And they're really looking forward to reading your book. Also this person, no question, just saying, thank you. I'm here with my three daughters, age seven, nine, and 12, who recently toured the house. Um, this has been fascinating. And thank you for taking all of their questions seriously and providing all this unknown information. Um, so yeah, awesome. Great job. Uh, and yes, thank you, Mary Jo, so much for coming. We really appreciate it. Um, for everybody who's still here in the chat, we do have a link to Mary Jo's new book. Um, we also have a link to her website if you wanna learn more about her and her writing. Um, so I will leave that up for a minute just so you can grab those links if you need them. And Mary Jo, is there anything um, that you wanted to add at the end? Well, thank you, Megan, for hosting and to Santa Clara City Library for making this possible. And thank you to the audience uh, for participating. I really appreciate it. All right. Thank you and good night. Great, thank you so much. Good night, Mary Jo.